Hello, and welcome to a new episode of OTT Talks. I am Enrique Mendizabal, OTT's founder and director. OTT Talks are short conversations with researchers and practitioners in the field of evidence-informed policy. In today's episode, we talk to Estefania Chaver, head of programs at Southern Voice. Estefania and Andrea Ordóñez recently published an insightful article on the positive impact that the COVID pandemic had on Southern Voice members particularly with their visibility in local and international debates. Now, OTT believes it is crucial to highlight science produced from the Global South, and this article has identified some significant trends that we would like to discuss. Thank you for joining us, Estefania. I want to start by asking you a little bit of background about Southern Voice, but first um, tell me, where, 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 are, where, are, where are you calling from? So hi Enrique, thank you very much for having me today. Um, so I'm Ecuadorian and I'm based in Quito right now. And how's how is Quito? How is Quito doing recently? Well, things are being rather calm. Um, we had some political upheavals a couple of months ago, but uh, things calm down and I think uh, we have a lot of political upside downs every single day, but other than that, so far, so good. Let's let's put it, let's put it that way. You're going through one of those calm phases before the storm that we're so used to in Latin America, probably, right? So That's what uh, I'm afraid the, of. <laughs> the crisis is around the corner. Um, so let me let me ask you something a bit more uh, work related. Uh, tell us something about Southern Voice. What is Southern Voice? So in a nutshell, we are a network of 59 think tanks uh, based in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We work um, as a platform for Global South researchers and we help them to leverage um, local data and research to contribute to global debates, uh, specifically on the sustainable development goals. So we do this in different ways. So we, we work with um, think tankers from the networking research projects. We also support them to find um, global spaces of dialogue where they can position their views and findings. And also since the pandemic, we launched a digital knowledge hub where we um, compiled resources on the impact of the, of the pandemic, which has been really successful. And it's very useful, um, very useful tool, by the way, and you can find it um, in the Southern Voice uh, website, southernvoice.org. Um, and you wrote this article um, looking at the experiences of many of your members and I think other, mem other organizations throughout the, the pandemic. Can you, can you tell us um, what are the main highlights from this article, which by the way, will be, we'll put a link to it in the blurb to this video and the podcast. Yeah, so first I would like to take a minute to explain how this article came to life. And uh, because it will help also um, frame a little bit um, the, the kind of information that we use to um, fit this article and then the sources that we use to in, in this article. So at early stages of, of the crisis, of the COVID crisis, so we saw that founders and Global South researchers had to think out of the box. So they need to plan research within, within the fraction of time they used to take to do it. Um, they also had to adapt their ongoing projects to the limitations brought by the pandemic. They need to repurpose previous data to inform new issues. So funding was relocated to address pressing research needs and so on and so forth. So we saw in the COVID crisis a, some sort of natural testing ground for think tanks. And instead of exploring the impacts of COVID, we focused on identifying positive changes in the research dynamics, so in the ways of collaborating between think tanks and other stakeholders, and that we think should remain in place in this new normalcy, or that we could even take um, one step further and maybe it could even be escalated. So these are precisely the elements to hi highlight about this article. So, after informal discussions with some of our member organizations and also after reviewing information from our research projects, we were able to, well, to tell that one of the positive aspects is that the pandemic enabled Global South Think Tanks to take a leading role in providing ideas to better respond to COVID and also to propose timely solutions. We also can you give me, that, sorry, can you give yeah. an example of, of, those, of those leading roles? How do those how does leading roles um, illustrate? Can I illustrate that with an example, yeah. maybe? 
So, for example, um, there was a, there is this um, think tank CBGA um, in India. They provided uh, feminist and civil society organizations uh, with necessary evidence to author a position paper on making learning accessible to, to girls, highlighting the specific needs and the limitations of girls in rural and urban settings. Um, and this was particularly important because um, at the time when education was um, basically um, um, was transformed in, in a way to, to the use of, because of the use of digital tools, it was really important actually to, to have some measures or to put in place some measures to help them um, adapt the, the response to make sure they reach out to all the students. Um, well, yeah, so basically we all, I think that, it, that the last thing that I would like to highlight from this article is that um, we thought that there was some sort of empowerment of Global South um, actors, and so not only um, in generating knowledge, uh, but also in disseminating it. And, and that's what we wanted to, to explore a little bit more in, in detail. So, so, so leadership, um, but also, also greater, greater visibility, greater impact. Uh, what do you think this, um, why this happened? What allowed this to happen? Or what factors contributed to this? What, what happened during COVID, right? That had not been there before. Yeah, um, so I think that to answer this question, it's key to acknowledge the context. And that is that the pandemic provoked uncertainty. So it made, uh, it made in, in many ways, uh, our, our normal ways to do things obsolete. So it boosted a demand for analysis, it boosted the demand for data and knowledge. Um, and in a context where the value of policy relevant research was reinforced, we saw think tanks proactively identifying project uh, problems sorry, in, in a timely manner and envisioning these solutions. So for example, uh, at early stages of the pandemic, uh, there was a Peruvian think tank, Grade, and um, they used rapid geospatial analysis and existing evidence from their ongoing research projects to, research, uh, to raise early alarms about how traditional marketplaces were potential sources of contagion. And this was only possible to identify uh, because they repurposed the, the data that they had um, and they were able to identify the riskiest markets um, located in Lima's most vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, by bringing this issue to the public attention, they managed to position this problem and this information was used to adapt the local response. And it also facilitated discussions on alternatives to prevent the, sp uh, the spread of the virus in, in similar high risk places. So this is just the one example of um, how, um, how this, uh, this, this context allowed things things to uh, react swiftly um, and also to, to provide new solutions to respond to the current uh, emergencies. But this, this refers to, for instance, the, it created an opportunity to innovate, but, um, you know, did they have more funding? Did they, you know, did they work with other organizations that they had not worked with before? You know, is there anything else that that enabled this innovation to take place. I can, I can imagine some think tanks, you know, having great ideas, but not having the funding to do that. And I think one of the early concerns during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember also running a survey and having conversations with think tanks. We actually had our annual conference online and, and, and people were very concerned about the ability, availability of funding for think tanks. And they expect that it would simply dry out because a lot of the funding would go to you know the response right the emergency and not to research yeah so i think that there were some factors that allowed think tanks to take a, a leading role um and i think that i would like to highlight the uh, um, three of them so one of them is flexibility um, another one is um and some sort of new partner arrangement and um the third one would be the opportunity to innovate. So I would like to point out that when I talk about flexibility, I mean both. So the possibility to adapt ongoing research projects as, as Grada, as the, men, as the example that I just mentioned, and also the availability of flexible funding to address pressing research needs and, and adapt or redesign the research agendas considering emerging priorities. Um, regarding new partnerships, um, I have to say that we saw that this partnerships proliferated. And re one reason could be that some of the funding available required that think tanks applied for it as a consortia. 
So encouraging either South-South or North-South collaborations. Um, also, another reason could be that there were more um, virtual events and these virtual modalities reduced, well, the time and the costs of partnerships and probably they made them, uh, that made them more attractive. But whatever the reason, these partnerships empower the organizations to influence research agendas, bring new ideas and bring new voices to the arena. And finally, I think that the, regarding innovation, I think that the pandemic tested the capacity of think tanks to respond to emerging needs and they needed to innovate to respond to, uh, to meet these pressing research needs, right? Um, they, were, um, they needed to innovate to remain relevant. And the survey we conducted in 2021 showed that most think tanks members of the network adapted their, their plans, the research plans to the COVID context. So that this not only included the thematic focus, uh, but also the work approaches they used. And um, also by reviewing the, the COVID hub, uh, we said that think tanks responded creatively to the pandemic uh, by then again repurposing research tools to answer to new questions um, and mm -hmm. using previous evidence to inform new issues. Let me let me jump to a kind of more of a global uh, discussion right now. So this is the issue of um, local research for local problems or southern research for southern problems. So I think one of the things that comes out in the article and the conversations we've had with Southern Voice is that um, and you've just mentioned it, there was a lot more demand for, for research from governments and, you know, local governments, you know, Peruvian government, the, the, the Kenyan government, the, the Bangladeshi government would have required data and analysis. And so they went to their, to the local think tank community, local research community. That, that's, that's quite clear. And I think the examples you've provided are very good. You know, think tanks reacted and responded um to that situation and anybody living in the global south during the pandemic would have seen that right with the more mentions of think tanks and experts in the media and an increased presence in social media as well as um as the public wanted to be informed as well mm. but the other point you make which is interesting is that what you're saying is that during the pandemic or the pandemic created the conditions for research from the global south to inform debates happening at the global level and potentially in the global north, right? So decisions that were being made in, in Washington, London, Geneva, et cetera, about the world and particularly about the global south, uh, which tend to be informed by researchers based in those, you know, in those cities and you know, in the region, became to be more informed by research done in the global south. Is that that's that's the that's the big change in a way, right? The visibility of research from the global south. In, um, in global um, spaces and global debates. Um, can you give us an example of, of, how, of how that happened and also what impact that visibility or that inclusion of research from the global, global South um, had? So um, maybe let, let's start by, um, let me start by saying that, so Global South knowledge um, can be more than just local knowledge. And I think this is um, what is starting to change. I think there is no doubt that Global South knowledge was decisive to ensure accurate and context specific um, answers, as you mentioned. Um, but I think it's worth recognizing them, that it has more to offer. It can also help understand global problems differently and yeah. inform decisions at the global level, right? So let me give you an example. So when the global lens is missing, the challenge of the majority are, is also missing. And when we talk about, let's say, the future of work, um, there was this research led by CPEC, an Argentinian think tank, and, and they make us think about the other side of the coin. So when we talk about the future of work, the discussion in the global north is focused on job loss. However, uh, when we think about the future of work and include the perspectives of the global south, this discussion goes beyond artificial intelligence making some jobs obsolete. Uh, so if we we want to truly talk about the global perspective, then the discussion should focus on this demographic boom and the extra 290 million workers that the global South will bring into the labor market in the next decade. Uh, we can also talk about the technological innovation in African countries where connectivity levels are really low, um, lack of digital access, lack, lack of digital skills and so on and so forth. So in other words, the reason why this example is so powerful is because Southern perspectives have the potential to shape the way we analyze the global problems. And as a result, they can inform, I mean, they can inform global decisions 
and influence the kind of global solutions needed. So this is for me like a super clear example of how can we influence global agendas. And the same thing happened during the pandemic where global south countries were creating these solutions to tackle a global problem based on the local experience. So I think this point was, was made clear uh, during the pandemic and um, hopefully it's going to be something that, that will last. And there is another example um, of organizations doing the same outside of the, of the pandemic crisis arena. That is the case of the International Center for Climate Change and Development. And they have been conducting rigorous research on climate change for more than a decade based on the local experience of Bangladesh, which, by the way, is a country very affected by the um, effects of climate change for a very long time now. And what is more interesting about this organization is that they use this grounded local knowledge to inform interne <clears throat> sorry, international organizations on climate change adaptation with the expectation that this knowledge benefits other least developed countries. So I think there are, um, there are examples of how this is um, hopefully um, changing for good because when the knowledge from the global health is missing, then the, the analysis of the challenge and the solutions are, are, not, are not complete. They are also missing the majority. But this is difficult, right? Let me let me um, let me bring in another idea. So this is difficult because if you're a think tank in Peru, you're a think tank in 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 Ghana. You're dealing with local politics and local issues coming up every day. You know, beginning of the conversation, we talked about the crisis around the corner for Ecuador. This happens everywhere. It's just if you're a think tank in the UK, you're dealing with a crisis every other week as well. A new a new issue on the agenda. If you think tank in the US, the same. Like you're if you're a domestic focused think tank, like most think tanks are you're dealing with your politics. If you want to make sure your research is affecting or influencing global debates, that, that requires an effort, right? You, you need to put time into it. You need to think about those debates. You need to write for those debates. You need to engage with those debates. That requires a lot of time and money to put it, uh, to put it some way, and even some expertise. And to some extent, Southern Voice is there to help out, right? Southern Voice is there to provide that, that additional support those connections those spaces that individually a think tank on their own might not be able to to deliver so the crisis provided an opportunity but once the crisis is over um once people start traveling again once um you know international development researchers are able to go to the countries to do the case studies themselves rather than to work in partnership with a think tank in the global south um it, once events are in person once again I think there's a risk that some of these gains might be lost. And I wonder what you think needs to be done. What do think tanks in the global south need to do to retain that space, right? To not lose those gains they've made in terms of the visibility of their work and also of their brands. Yeah, so I think that when you talk about change, there is uh, one part of change that comes from within and another part of change that comes uh, from an, um, from the context or the environment where think tanks are working. So to me, um, certainly think tanks can invest more in focusing on global agendas and then there can be organizations such as Southern Voice providing some support. But, um, and I think that those are the things that we can control. Uh, but then there, there is also the other element, which is the external element and the ecosystem that where we have less control and, and to make a change there, so um, global debates are more receptive to, to, to this knowledge or where think tanks can participate more in this, um, in this global debates. There needs to be a change in the, in the paradigm and, and the way, how do we see um, a local, uh, or local knowledge or lo knowledge produced in the global south? How we and, value uh, it, right? Exactly. And so what do think tanks need to do differently? I think that they need to remain relevant to keep this high demand for global South knowledge. And I believe think tanks could greatly benefit, benefit from capitalizing on the experience and the success they had during these early stages of the pandemic. So they can use this experience of doing partnerships differently and of accessing and managing more flexible funding to gain some more legitimacy and propose to partners and donors to do things in a different way. Why not? So think tanks need more agency to benefit from better arrangements and move from a stage of receiving to more active a stage of asking what works best for them. So they were able already the to showcase their work. 
Oh, demanding, demanding the kind exactly. of support and the kind of partnerships that work for them and that work for their context and that work for the agendas and the needs of the of their society and the communities and those who they want to serve. Precisely. They were already able to showcase the kind of work that they're able to do to network with these new partners. So now I think it is the, the moment to piggyback on this and create more suitable conditions for them. And let me finish with one question. So and what do think tank funders and think tank supporters, what should they be doing, you know, from out of this experience? I think it's important to acknowledge that donors are crucial actors when we talk about doing things differently. And this is because they can influence the pays and the agenda of partnerships, for example. So in order to support Southern grantees, I think funders could remain open to new forms of partnerships and maybe encourage different dynamics between partners from the global north and the global south. Um, they could also keep um, flexible funding available. And this is um, especially important because I think uh, it has been effective enabling um, recipients of this funding um, to engage better with policy making and maybe also to secure some sort of smooth uh, response to, to local needs. Um, and also something else, I think funders can also spread the word <laughs> about what has worked, right? So talking about this positive experience with other donors can help create some new trends and they can also contribute to create new standards on how funding should look like to support inclusive knowledge um, generation. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, showcase their own grantees, right? Uh, celebrate the work that their grantees have done so that others can find out about their, their great work and their contribution. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Estefania. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us in this episode of OTT Talks. It was a fascinating and insightful conversation, Estefania. For those watching or listening to it, you will be able to access the Southern Voice article in the blurb for the episode. And of course, I invite you to visit Southern Voice at southernvoice.org and their social media. And of course, on Think Tanks at onthinktanks.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invite. It was a pleasure being here.